In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, Saint Joseph, our patron saints and guardian angels, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel today of the Wedding Feast of Cana, of course, is the continuation of our Lord's public ministry as we begin these, this time of ordinary time. The church is kind of taking his life as he began his public ministry uh, and recounting these events as they occurred. And of course, one of the most important events the important, most important events was the beginning of that public ministry which took place at the wedding feast of Cana. That here, Our Lady is really the protagonist, the central, you might say, center of attention. Because it mentions, it says, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. She is mentioned first and says, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited. But Our Lady is there acting as the, the mediatrix, the protagonist, the one who's going to, to bring about the first public miracle of her son. And so when the wine runs short, she says, son, they have no wine. And he says something rather interesting in that it seems like he's being kind of rude, but it's not. He says, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. Fulton Sheen says that the Greek is much more succinct than that. That our Lord really said to her, Woman, what to me to thee? My hour has not yet come. Now some may see that as a question. Woman, what to me to thee? Or it could be a statement. Woman, what to me to thee? Meaning, what you're going to ask of me is also going to involve you as well. Because, of course, we know that Our Lady knew that her son was to be the Savior of all mankind. And he says to her, my hour has not yet come. Meaning, whenever he said his hour, he meant his passion. He's saying to his mother, woman, what to me, to thee? My hour has not yet come. It's not time for my passion. But Our Lady says, no, it is. It's time. Because she doesn't say anything more. She says, do whatever he tells you. Because Our Lady knows that if our son works his first public miracle, it begins his way and his walk to Calvary. It does begin his hour, does start at the wedding feast of Cana. And Our Lady knew very well that she was going to be involved in this work. You know, St. Peter Julian Amard says that those 30 years that our Lord and Our Lady lived together in that quiet solitude at, at Nazareth, they weren't just playing cards at night, you know. He was instructing her about his public, what he was there for. And so she knew very clearly that she was going to be involved as she was from the very beginning when she said, fiat, let it be done to me according to thy word, that that fiat wasn't just at that moment, but for every other moment that followed after that. She was always saying, yes, Lord, let it be done to me. And now she says to her son, let it be done to you. He said, my hour has not yet come, and yet our Lord goes to Calvary under the obedience to his heavenly Father, but he also goes to Calvary because his mother says, yes, go. She gives her consent. Yes, son, your hour has become, has, be, has begun now. That's one of the reasons why she's the co-redemptrix, she who is with the Redeemer. It's not just that she provided the sacrifice in the body of Christ to be offered on the cross, but she also gave her consent. Yes, son, I give you permission to die for the sins of, of the nation, to die for all of us. And that is what she's saying at the wedding feast of Cana, do whatever he tells you. And it says that this was the first of his public miracles and that his disciples began to believe in him that they had the first, you might say, inkling of supernatural faith. It wasn't just that they thought, oh, he, you know, up until this time, they thought maybe he's a great prophet. 
But when he works his first public miracle, they began to have divine faith. And that faith was mediated them to them through the mediation of Our Lady. Because she said to her son, do whatever he tells you. And of course, our Lord does not argue with his mother. And I don't think our Lord was doing this in a way to, to, to put Our Lady down, but rather to highlight her role. He says, woman. Why does he call her woman? It wasn't a, a lady. It was, it's like lady. It's like a, a sign of respect. But he's also trying to point out that she's the same woman of Genesis 3.15. That when we heard the first gospel proclaimed to man after the fall in the garden, that proto-evangelium is the woman and her seed, which will crush the head of Satan. And so our Lord is drawing attention. Listen to all you good Jews who are going to read the gospel today. And anybody else who would come later, when they see the word woman, they're going to go and search through Scripture, wherever that word appears. This is the woman of Genesis 3.15. This is the woman here in, at the wedding feast of Cana. And we're going to hear our Lord say woman again at the end of this gospel, at the foot of the cross. He's going to look down at his mother and say, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. That our Lord wants to point out that it's the same woman. It's the same mystery. It's the same person who's doing all these things. And so she is our co-redemptrix. She is the one who suffered with her son, who suffered for all of us. Just as our Lord offered his sacrifice on Calvary for every soul, every man, woman, and child, from the beginning of time until the end of time, so Our Lady was given mystically to offer her sacrifice for all of those souls. It's called the objective redemption. She participated in that with her son because she is the woman of Genesis 3.15. We can participate in the subjective redemption. We can offer our sacrifices for other souls. But we can't offer our sacrifice for the salvation of all mankind like Our Lady and Our Lord did. He is our Redeemer and she is our co-redemptrix. And so we do owe her a great deal of gratitude for what she has suffered for love of us. And our Lord is highlighting her role today in the gospel. It's almost like he's setting her up to get the attention. Woman, what to me to thee? My hour has not yet come. But he is wanting to show that he does this, begins his public ministry, he begins his walk to Calvary through his mother's intercession. Because she has, not, even though she doesn't appear at every page explicitly in Scripture and through his public ministry, she appears at the most important points and the most important times. Of course, the Annunciation, his birth, the wedding feast at Cana, and the foot of the cross, and then again at Pentecost. Those are all important events in the life of the individual soul and in, in the life of the church, which we're all a part of. And this wedding at Cana in Galilee was not the wedding so much of this couple that was being married that day. Our Lord used this setting of a wedding to show there was a much, import, mo, a much more important espousal wedding that was taking place. And that was the bridegroom and the bride. The bridegroom in this case was Christ, and the bride is represented by Our Lady, who is the bride of Christ and, the, and is the first member of the church. Because this wedding at Cana in Galilee, it says, you have saved the best wine for last. And that's so true because at the end of this gospel, when our Lord says to his mother, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother, what is, the, what is the last words of our Lord says on the cross before he gives up his spirit? He says, does he say it is finished? No. He says, consummatum est. It is consummated. What is consummated? A wedding. A marriage is consummated at cross, at Calvary. Because at the Calvary, finally, she who was called to be the mother of the church is conceiving her first child and gives birth to the first child of the rest of the church, the rest of his brothers, at the foot of the cross. Woman, behold your son. John is not her son in the flesh. He's related to her, but 
She becomes, he becomes the spiritual child and she becomes the mother of the church. That that wedding at Cana in Galilee, where our Lord and our Lady were the bridegroom and the bride, is finally consummated at Calvary. And he does save the best wine for last. And that consubstantial wine, his own body, blood, soul, and divinity at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And don't we call the holy sacrifice of the Mass also the wedding feast of heaven? That it is a wedding feast that we come to because Christ is here under the sacramental presence of the priest, but also in the Holy Eucharist as the bridegroom. And we are the bride. And you know, sometimes people get upset when, you know, receiving communion on the tongue. Oh, I'm not a little child, you know, or I'm not a baby. You don't have to feed me. But that's, they're missing the point. I've been to many weddings, and the reception, there's always a part of the reception. I don't know if this is a tradition in the United States or if this is a tradition that has always been held in some cultures, but at the reception, there's the cutting of the wedding cake. And the, and the first ones to eat of the wedding cake are the bridegroom and the bride. But do they take a piece and feed themselves? No, usually they cross hands and the bride feeds the bridegroom and the bridegroom feeds the bride. That is a sign of great affection. That I don't, I want to feed you with myself. And so Christ at the Holy Communion, he is the bridegroom. He comes to give you of himself and it's not something you should take but you receive out of great love. And even if you are, they say, well, I'm not a little child. Well, you should be a little child in the spirit, childlike. You know, that at some points that we, a mother feeds her baby, but also at the end of our lives, sometimes when we're old and can't feed ourselves, it's a great act of love to feed that other person who can't help themselves. And spiritually, we cannot help ourselves without God's grace. So I think that this wedding feast of Cana is so important that we not forget. So many people today want to relegate Our Lady as just this other figure, not important. Well, Christ brings her always to the center of attention. It's not Our Lady taking upon herself these roles. She isn't standing forward. She just says, son, they have no wine. But our Lord is elevating her, showing that how much he is relying upon her and her cooperating with his work of redemption. Not because he has to, but because he wills to, because he wants to. And it is fitting that he do it this way, that the, the second Adam, Christ is the second Adam, has as his, as his helpmate the second Eve, and this second Eve does not bring down the first Adam, but she is his, truly the most helpful servant of that second Adam, as the first Eve should have been of the first Adam. So Our Lady undoes that disobedience by her great cooperation in the plan of God. And our Lord elevates her, shows forth how much he wants us to take Our Lady and put her into our lives. You know, the Protestants, when they read this passage from the Gospel of John, and our Lord says, and our Lady says, do whatever he tells you, they write our Lady off and say, see, all I have to do is what our Lord tells me to do. I don't have to pay attention to that woman anymore. But they forget, at the end of the Gospel, our Lord says, if you say, do whatever he tells you, he says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Yes, our, Lord, our Lady says, do whatever he tells you, and Jesus says, behold your mother and take her into your home. You know, to the degree that we take Our Lady into our home, to that degree we will be faithful servants and followers of Christ. It's because he understands that if he puts us under her care, she who never ever disobeyed even one of his desires, always fulfilled his will, is the best person to put us under her care. Let us be mindful of that, and if we haven't given ourselves to Our Lady, consecrated ourselves to her, then do so. You're going to make greater progress. You're going to be truly wise. That wisdom that our Lord talked about, or that St. Paul 
writes about to the Corinthians, about how there's all these different gifts from the Spirit, that they all are given to do certain great tasks, that Our Lady as spouse of the Holy Spirit mediates those graces of the Holy Spirit to us. And to the degree that we follow her lead, because as fathers and doctors of the church say, one of the first graces that Our Lady mediated to the disciples there at the wedding feast, not only faith, but also the gift of fear of the Lord. Because the gift of the fear of the Lord is the first stage of wisdom to obey and to be attentive to the Lord. Because that's what the fear of the Lord means, is I want to obey God. Our Lady shows that through obedience we are truly wise. And when we follow the Lord, we are truly wise. And that's not just for an individual soul, myself and you included, that in our own spiritual lives that we start saying, you know, what am I supposed to do for our Lord today? Not just go about my task, but say, is there something that I should be doing for our Lord today? How does he want me to live my life today? That's the first stage of wisdom. But for a nation to have the fear of the Lord, to not discount and to poo-poo the teachings of the church, for a world to somehow say, oh, this teaching of the Catholic Church, forget that, it's not important. We're really the wise people here. We know what's best for you. That's the little hiss from hell. Oh, don't listen to God. Don't listen to his church. That's just a bunch of men. No, it's not. It's the mystical body of Christ. And to the degree that those who are in the church obey the Lord and follow his counsel, we will truly be wise, and we will be lights to the nation, and truly will make a better world, not through human effort alone, not through some materialistic plan of the United Nations or the Great Reset or some diabolical disguise of wisdom, which isn't wisdom at all, but foolishness. They say that the folly of God is greater than the wisdom of man. And we know that there is no folly in God. Let us today be like those good servants at the wedding feast who did what our, our Lord told them through the mediation of Our Lady. They went and filled those water jars to the brim. It's interesting that it says that they filled them to the brim in one of the translations. And why? Because in the Polish, the expression for Our Lady is full of grace, waski pelna. There's a, there's a nuance to it. It's not just she's full of grace, but she's full to the brim. You can't put any more in her. That they fill those water jars, as you might say, as an imitation of who Our Lady is. She's full, full of God. We can't put any more in her. Yet she has been given to us as the bride of Christ, the first bride, the one that the church represents. She, is the, she goes before the church as the faithful bride of Christ. And let us also, as we are all espoused to our Lord in baptism, as we had last Sunday, the baptism of our Lord, our Lord comes to unite himself to us, that our wills should be united to his will in an espousal union of love. Let us ask Our Lady for that grace today, that we will truly live like spouses of Christ, united to him in heart and mind, only wanting to do what is pleasing to him. For that is what all marriages are but a, a type of, that that union between husband and wife is supposed to be even more so the spiritual union that exists between Christ and his church and the individual soul that's a member of that church that there should be no difference in their wills and in their hearts and minds, that they are only one in Christ. That is what is really needed in our world today, is more and more people being united to Christ and asking him, what do we need to do to make our world a better place? What is the teaching of the church that should be applied in this particular aspect of my life or in society? then we will be truly wise and not foolish like the pagans. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.